Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to book two, Nick 10 of the uh, Orphan's Tales Live reading series. Uh, it's another scorching evening here in Maine. It has been the hottest, muggiest, stillest heat wave, completely shark attacks and tornadoes. Uh, <laughs> over the last um, week, two weeks. It's been crazy and we lost power, uh, some substation blew. So the whole so south half of the city and two islands lost power for ages, just hours and hours on, on Sunday. So we missed Sunday, I do apologize for that. Um, but we're here tonight, it's all happening tonight. Uh, I would really like to leave the house. Um, that's just all I kind of think about. I would like to go somewhere and do something and have someone like serve me a drink. That would be amazing. Uh, listen to somebody play music with like an instrument. Uh, I think we used to do that. I don't know. I can't trust my memory. Maybe we used to do that. Uh, yeah, it would be really nice. I'm starting to, <laughs> starting to really have had enough of it, but uh, that doesn't matter. It will never stop. Oh, yay. Okay, so with that uh, cheerful <laughs> pronouncement of uh, existential despair, um, yeah, I, I, I have a super busy weekend coming up, like crazy work this weekend. Uh, actually, like the next eight days are just nuts for me. Um, but I am here with you, present, uh, as present as I possibly can be. Um, I will do my little intro bit and we will get into it. Uh, even the palms of my hands are hot. Uh, Sebastian today was just going hot, 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 mama. Uh, and I feel him, man. Like, he can't say cold. Hot is the only sort of temperature word or weather word that he knows. Rain or hot, there's only two. But uh, it, it was an appropriate level of crying. Uh, I, I wish that I could access that still, because that's exactly how I feel when it's hot. Um, okay, so, as usual, for legal reasons, this is not... You guys know this, you can just say it along with me. This is not an audiobook of The Orphan's Tales. It is a play, a one-woman show. Uh, you can find music based on these books at sjtucker.com. You can uh, get copies of them from your local independent booksellers web portal. Uh, and I would request, if you care, uh, to do that rather than um, the big giant behemoths online, which will usually be fine and survive all this. and. Um, indie stores may not, so please support them. My local indie store is printbookstore.com uh, and you can get these books through them. Um, you can find me on Twitter, at Kat Valenti, uh, ruining your childhood by revealing how terrible George Lucas and uh, Steven Spielberg are uh, lately. You can find me on Patreon at Kat Valenti where there is a recipe for apple cheddar scones up today and a uh, fairly uh, balls to the wall review of Hamilton, um, quite a long one, <laughs> um, uh, up uh, from Monday. Uh, so you can get all kinds of great content there. Uh, you can ask me questions after the reading, um, but dead air sucks, so try to think of what you want to talk about while I'm reading so that we can uh, seg right into it, rather than me looking awkwardly at the camera, which I'm definitely going to do in half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, and you can catch up in the archive anytime uh, at Cat Valenti Live on YouTube. Um, you can also, it, it, it gets hosted here on Instagram as well. So uh, since they changed how that whole thing works, it's a lot easier for you to just swing by my Instagram profile and, and, and catch up there. Um, I said it, I always forget one of them. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, if you would like to toss a coin to your witch, there is a tip chart on my Instagram profile, uh, my YouTube profile, and uh, on my website, which is katherinemvalenti.com. Uh, you don't have to. These are absolutely free, but uh, times are really tight for us, and uh, every, every penny helps. So if you are so moved, it would be deeply appreciated. Thank you so, so, so much to Syed and Joe, um, who tipped me uh, last week. You guys are the best. Uh, I really can't express how much it means. Um, and anybody who does, I will thank you on the next stream because it really is, it really does mean the world. Um, you know, we had a whole conversation on Twitter uh, about how authors never get paid for readings and uh, it really is something that we do for no compensation for the most part. And uh, you guys have, through this um, 
quarantine, you've bought my groceries and you have paid my water bill uh, and little things here and there like that uh, just have made this so much easier and uh, my family deeply, deeply appreciates it. Uh, you have kept Sebastian in blueberries, which is practically all he will eat these days. So thank you so much, you guys. It really, really means a lot. Uh, let's get ready to Kappa, shall we? Um, we are deep in the in the reptile house in these books. Uh, good night, eat the Robin. Um, so we will have more more turtle and lizard goodness uh, ahead of us. If you are following along at home, we're on page one eighty one. I have a little uh, throat moistener here. I'm drinking rosé tonight, which is not my usual gig at all, but it's cold, which is really what I'm looking for in anything these days. Uh, so this may be the only time you ever see me with a, a rosé or white wine in my hand. That is, it is absolutely not uh, my usual drink. All right, let's, let's get into it. The tale of the lizard's lesson continued. I'm a ghost librarian, the voice said, a shade who carries lizards to and fro opens and closes pens, but no more. I will become a glass crone with wrinkles like prisms, but I will never be queen. I will haunt my wretched mourning mother and I will make sure the eggs are dry. And that is all. We gawked a little, I admit. That is not very good manners, but perhaps we can be forgiven. What is it then that you wish to barter from us, Yoi who was born in the evening? I cleared my throat. It is a matter of roses, Australia, who was born in the rain, I said shyly. Ah, oh, roses are very interesting, are they not? Did you know that if you feed one nothing but sugar water and a mash of honeybees, it becomes sweet and thick enough to be fried for sandwiches like boar meat or fish? We have lunched on rose and leek sandwiches for most of this season. We expressed some interest in this, and we were shown the parent lizards for that recipe, one grafting process so complex there hardly seemed to be a lizard beneath the markings, one anatomical diagram of a large pike. They lolled about in their pen, proud of their children, their thick legs and flamboyant tails, and knew nothing of what was on their skins. We were shown by invisible hands all the lizards which had a thing to do with roses and spent many months there in, con in contemplation. Yazo was beside herself, her breath thick and fast, her water jostling in her skull. I kept away from her when she spilled herself, and the days after when she could not remember who she was. It was too disturbing. I did not know how to ask again how she could torture herself so. Only once did I stumble upon her at her grisly ritual. I had a theory regarding ink and yolk production I wanted to share with her, and I admit that contrary to manners, I burst into her room to find her on her knees on a white mat with a silver bowl before her grimaced and would have left her, but she turned her black eyes to me and the green bags beneath them were so terrible and deep, and I knelt at her side. Yasa, who was born at the bottom of winter, please do not do this. It is an obscenity. I cannot bear to witness it. Do you not see your webbing, your hair? I am teaching myself a lesson, Yoi. Myself and all Kappa. Of course I see it. She brushed my tonsure fondly. I am sorry it distresses you. But you must understand, the others think that to lose one's water is only a matter of a few days, bleary eyes, and stumbling into things. It is much worse. No one will believe it, and so I show them in my skin. When I am gone far enough, they will understand that we must find a place where the water can be kept safe and never spilt out for the amusement of a village oaf. She coughed and took my hand. I do not remember now how to grow the pomegranate ant. I've done nothing of note because I cannot remember how. One day I will not remember when I was born, but that is all right. Then they will see. I helped her. Forgive me. I helped her to bend forward into the bowl and listen to the blue splash, blue splash of the water in the silver and looked into her skull when she had finished, empty and dry, the color of old weeds. I laid her in her bed and sang to her while she slept insensate. In only another month, while Yazo was stumbling in the dark and crying, and even I could not reach her, I asked Ostraya, I had a little glass bell which let her know I wanted her, to bring me the glass lizard, which is to say the lizard which first carried on it a way of making glass, of blowing it into shapes. 
I held under my arm an enormous red female who would absolutely not stop licking her own eyeballs. She was a rose lizard, the very simplest one I could find. On her back was nothing more than a minutely fine, infinitely detailed image of a rose, perfect in every petal and thorn. It was red, red on red, the rose itself a deeper and bloodier shade than her skin. Lestria was quiet for a long while, but I could hear her breathing and knew she was not gone. He is an ancient fellow, she said finally, a miserable, hoary old monarch besides. If it is too much to ask in the glass country to see this beast, Ostria, who was born in the rain. But she brought him in a wicker basket with his own blue pillow, a gray and green and crusty bull, his crest flopped over as though exhausted with the effort of staying upright for so many years. His eyes were milky and filmed, his throat emitted a constant rattle, but he was covered in, in instructions, and so I felt generous toward him. He bit me, of course, when I placed him in the pen next to my scarlet female. Lizards are vicious. By the time Yazo was herself again, though, she looked strangely at me when I used that phrase. The red lizard was getting her ne nest ready and looking very pleased with herself. We waited and waited and ate rose and leek sandwiches and rose steaks and rose roasts and poached rose until we had to say very politely to be sure that rose was no longer quite to our liking, begging the pardon of all our estimable hosts. When we departed the wide prairie, we had passed through the warm season and into the cold again. The next glass rain was still weeks off, according to the latest lizards. We had in our packs a very curious young thing with coral skin and a stark black lesson snaking across his back. And even Yazo was talkative. We have a very splendid illustration of our lizard here. It was very clever of you, Yoi, who was born in the evening. I will tell everyone that it was you and not me who discovered it. She chirruped, skipping down the breeding house steps like a child. We walked out of the womb warm hall and into a clear, freezing day. The sun streaked through heavy clouds and played chasing games with the grass. And very lightly, it began to snow. We laughed and stuck out our tongues, feeling very strange indeed to feel snowflakes falling into our skull water. We turned back to look at the bright tiled roof, all colored, covered in white, and saw at the door a beautiful, sad-eyed young woman, all of glass. Her hair fell in crystal rivers to her waist, and her dress was crisply cut, frosted at the elbows. Her hands were slender and tipped in blue, her cheeks jeweled and clear, a little glass mole on the side of her transparent nose. She waved us farewell, her mouth a wide, sparkling smile through which the sun lay. At her feet was a huge, fat lizard on a glittering leash, his glass belly rippling, crystalline and swollen, his fringe sharp enough to cut, his tongue hanging out of his mouth like a glass bookmark. The ferryman's tale continued. Our little coral bull was a sensation in the greater kappa. His lesson, which became our lesson, was enough to catch the breath of all the turtles with their feet tangled in cucumbers. How to make a rose which would never die or wilt which would lose one petal in a century, whose gloss and shine were like glass and who would last until all the glass of the world were turned back to sand. This is the rose I seek. The Kappa gestured toward the glass houses. It is there. I told you we chose this place. We chose because of Yazo, darling Yazo. Yazo who was born at the bottom of winter. By the time we had become famous, by the time the Upas and the Ixora grew tall in the thesis fields, and the corral was full of rolling manticore, fat and furry as kittens, and fluttering firebirds. She had almost no skin on her. Her webbing hung from her fingers in shreds, her eyes were sunken, her hair had fallen out. She did not know her own name, but I told it to her every day. I woke her and whispered in her green ear, You are Yazo, who is beautiful, and was born at the bottom of winter, and my friend. Everything I did, the great grafts and splices that made my name, I told everyone that she was the senior of us, that she was my collaborator, my indispensable partner. Her name rose with mine even as she forgot it entirely, and nothing I said in the morning mattered. She prodded our kittens listlessly, did not notice that if they nipped her thumbs. But she did what she, was, what she meant to, 
She proved to them all the danger of losing the skull water, that it was more than a few days of blear and blight. She pleaded with us to move the greater Kappa to a safe place, a place where horrid villagers would not be forever bowing to us and laughing at our spill, where we could be sure that we would not lose ourselves as she did. Yoy led me to the houses, whose shattering traced lines over every pane of glassy eyes. Shapes moved inside, but she did not invite me to enter. The greater Kappa is all around you, she said gently. These are greenhouses. Here on the roof of the world, our water freezes and does not flow out. By her we are saved, and the best minds of the Kappa are preserved against the depredations of the average vicious child. I'm glad for you. I said, putting my hand on her little shoulder where the rim of her shell met flesh. Though your houses seem to be in disrepair, perhaps I can help with that if you give me what I need. She snorted. We do not need your help. Pushing the door of one of the larger houses open, I was thrust into a world of green. Green plants and green turtles and a sea of heads glittering blue, liquid water rippling bright. Hundreds of eyes turned to me and rega regarded me with calm. Cold took the houses, but in most cases ice is as good as glass. Here it is warm, here we may be intimate with each other and let our skulls thaw. Here we teach our lessons as we always have and our catalogue grows. But we keep ourselves to ourselves, and the world comes no more begging bouquets at our door. Until you... Her expression grew grave and sad. But the cucumbers, for some reason, the cucumbers detest the climate and they refuse to grow. We have all the blossoms we could want, but their taste is inferior to the fruit. I've brought you so many varieties. Surely you can breed a cucumber with a heart of ice. All I ask is my rose. I kept my wings folded neatly back and stooped under the ice roof, trying to be as small and familiar as it is possible to be a swan among turtles. Yes, well, you must wait, huffed Yoy. We hardly keep mature specimens on hand for the pleasure of whatever outlandish flying thing finds its way to our doorstep. But we would enjoy the cucumbers now, of course. She grinned, finally, and her teeth were small and brown and neat, like the wooden model of a child's teeth. I handed over my sack amiably, and the capo scurried forward like cats to cream, sorting those to eat from those to dissect, and chewing greedily at the unfortunate fruits which were deemed too common to breed. And as they ate, Yoi beckoned each of them away from the feast into her, touching the water of their skulls and whispering. When the meal was done, I was sent away, told to meditate on the wonders of succeeding generations of plant life. A glass house was provided for my comfort, an empty cottage at the far corner of the village. Why do you have an empty house if you do not expect visitors? I asked as I was gently but firmly pushed toward the door by a dozen webbed hands. Yoi answered me, her face downcast. It is Yasa's house, who died the day we came to this mountain. We keep it in her honor, and you must treat it kindly. It was a long while to wait. I wrapped my wings around myself in the low-raftered house of Yazo, slowly opening and closing them in intimation of the poor lonely moon. This is the Hussein's way of meditating, and when her light shone through the shattered panes, my skin was covered in her, covered in long lines of blue like a mother's arms. I considered many things, though not often among them was the nature of succeeding generations of plant life. In my mind, lightened by the nearness of the moon, I designed the dome of Shadukium, shaped it petal by frame until it stood erect and perfect within me. And when it was done, Yoi came to collect me. She wore a little black cap, which I took to be a sign of respect for her absent comrade in, which, in whose house I trespassed. She did not explain it. I followed her up the snow-pat street and into the greenhouse where I had first seen rippling water in the depths of her tonsure. Within were countless kappa, all respectfully standing at attention, their hands clasped together. In the head of each one floated a flawless rose, pink and white and red, without blemish or brown. Yoi slowly removed her cap, and beneath it, too, was a large and spotless flower, as true a scarlet as any I have seen before or since. I must have looked surprised, for she laughed, a small musical sound like wooden drums pattered upon by rain. How did you think we grew these things? In the soil, like farmers. Every lesson I have taught, from Lily Berry to Ixora, was grown first in my own head. 
Where else should I, where else should I trust it? Take these things, Idle, who supposes he was born at night, and do not let our work be forgotten in the world below. One by one, the Kappa reached into their skulls and fluffed their flowers, careful not to spill a drop. And one by one, they piled them into my sack until it was brimful with roses. Farewell, Yoi, who was born in the evening, I said, and I ducked out of the glass house. And as I did, I saw the smallest of cucumbers budding from the wall. And so was finally built the Rose Dome of Shadukium, as I had constructed it in the, as I had constructed it in the house of Yazo, who was born at the bottom of winter, so it blossomed over the infant city, its colours reflected in the cart tracks of the mud streets. My siblings and I flew back and forth over the apex, nets full of immaculate flowers suspended from our shoulders, sewing them to the superstructure with infinite care, a thread of diamonds and iron and the stalks which arched so high and bore their roses with grace long enough that no one can now speak of Shadukian without her roses, are glass, all glass, perfect and pure as ice, perfect and pure as a young woman's face. And once in a century there would be a strange soft rain as each rose lost a petal, and the petals would drift to the streets that were mud, and then stone, then silver, not unlike a Hussein peeled off from the face of the moon. All this completed, I went to the city fathers of Shadukium and asked for my payment, my opals, and my silver. I considered briefly that I should have asked for better, but agreements are agreements, and living stones rarely break theirs. Imagine my surprise when the Shaduki governor glowered darkly and mumbled that he could not possibly render my payment when the flowers that crowned his city were clearly no roses, but some monstrous abomination of a flower that only a spectre like myself would know where to find. Did I not do just as you asked? Did I not find for you an imperishable rose? Well, the little man shuffled, twisting his bracelets in anxiety as I flared my wings, towering over him. Even on this point, we must disagree. They are not strictly imperishable, are they? One petal in a century, it's quite a lot of work for the city sanitation on those occasions. He sweat, red and redolent under my nose. I have worked wonders for you. I whispered. I, even so, said he, I will bring down the dome on your heads. The shattering of the frame will be heard all the way to the sea. Again, said the wretched governor, his hands weighted in gold. We must disagree. It is difficult to subdue a Hussein. One might as well try to keep the moon still. But they gagged me and bound me. And there were so many of them, so many like ants, and the blood they drew from my scalp was white and thick, like molten bone. They bound me and dragged me up to the highest of the diamond turrets, which were clearer and sharper in those days than they have ever been since. And with so many hands, they impaled me on its tapered tip. I saw the glittering edge of the turret slide through me, dripping white, shredding through my skin. I shrieked, owl shrill. There was no help, only their laughter which perhaps you know well enough, my boy. My siblings tried to release me. They were kept away by volleys of arrows so thick they seemed to be flocks of ravens flinging themselves at the Hussein. For nine days I lay there bleeding on my roses and they kept vigil watching me die. I screamed, I cursed, and all of Shadukium listened as though I were a great bell tolling out their hours. I bellowed out any number of dooms, any number of hideous wishes to the alabaster ears of my mother. Maybe she could not see me up there on the roof of a city. Does she see the grackles, the sparrows, the doves? She did not see me. But I seem to remember now in that history before history so long ago that as the ninth sun set, I sobbed weakly and begged her to let that place die too, to let it become as dead and gray as her own dry kneecaps to let it starve, since it would feed no one but itself. I seem to remember this, and I am sorry. The tale of the crossing continued. With that ninth sun, I perished there, and I cannot say what became of my body no more than any man can. I came here. It is the first thing I remember, the lonely shore on the ferry, and the bones and the lizards. We are all translated on these shores. And I am sure I don't understand it, but there is a kind of poetry and metamorphosis. And if I could but see my lizards, I should be very interested to know what is written on their backs. 
I was angry at first and the little things scratched so terribly and my journey on the lake was much farther than yours. When the storm came, I seized the pole from the ferryman in a frenzy of itching and impatience. A nice old woman with no teeth at all and two parrot's heads squawking out of her palms. I tried to steer myself and fell into the water. I'd advise you not to try it. When I spluttered and gasped my way onto back onto the raft, the old woman was gone and I have been the ferryman for all the years upon years that have piled up since in this place. Seven blinked and chuckled a little. That's quite a story. It'll shrugged, almost as good as yours. A few drops of rain splattered onto his broad face. And as is the way of storms, once the first drops had squeezed from the sky, the rest came tumbling after, and soon the pair was drenched. This is your storm, Seven asked shakily, trying not to think of the creatures scurrying beneath that pitiful scrap of cloth. But the ferryman shook his head. Best let me shelter you, boy. We aren't going to make it across before they come through. Ittle held out his arms, and shuddering, Seven fell into the embrace, his teeth chattering as bone arms and flesh hands wrapped him. As the cloak stuck to his skin like wet grass, like two ponderous wing frames, their hollow bones whistling in the whirling wind, tore through the cloth and closed over his body. He could feel the lizards moving and tried not to look them in the eye. But the backs, he saw their backs, and on one was a terrible song of wind through broken windows, and on the other was a complicated algorithm concerning cloud patterns, and together he thought they might say something about the stain of the rain. Suddenly the wind began to shriek, truly shriek, dozens upon dozens of throttling screams rolled past Seven's ears, men's cries and women's keenings, children's hitching sobs. Clouds whipped by him sharp and hard, slashing his cheeks. He felt warm blood dripping from his chin. The rain was nothing, he could not even feel it, but the terrible shrieking and the hard clouds, they clutched at him, trying to reach him through the cage of Idle's arms. The ferry pitched and bobbed on the raging water, spray flinging itself against the two passengers. Wisps of grey clouds snapped from the wide wings like laundry on the line. Seven gripped the ferryman's frame and shut his eyes, buffeted and battered by the voices on the wind. And as quickly as it has, had come, it was over. Seven stood on the ferry, his face bleeding onto the boards, it'll slowly folding his wings up again under his cloak and picking up the long pole once more. What sort of storm did you expect in this place, Seven? They come through every hour is like chariots rounding the last corner. Everything is plainly itself here, no more and no less. You bear up under the storm of souls and cross the lake of the dead. The old man's mouth twisted into a mocking smile. Are we not courteous to name ourselves so succinctly? Are we not kind? Be glad I have not yet tired of my work. Be glad the moon is patient. I would have pushed you overboard and had my peace. Seven sat heavily against the mast. He wiped at his bloody face. But you are not dead, my friend, Idle went on. You are as you are and untranslated. How did you ever find your way here? The boy shrugged. There's a lake here, there's a lake there, a lake and a cave and a grove. And if you pay the maid who lives there, he cleared his throat, if you pay her enough, she will open the cave and the grove and the lake and let you pass. Idle snorted. Strop it. I shall have to have a word with her. Seven smiled weakly. I find it curious, the ferryman continued, that you have never once asked whether I carried her across, your tree girl, and how she came, like you or like me. There was a long pause. I know she came. I know it. I suppose you will see soon enough. And indeed, it was not long before the mist cleared and a long silver shore spread out before them, glistening gray pebbles washed by weak gray foam. A small paint peeled dock jutted into the still sulking water. Lashing the ferry to it, Idle squinted into the murky forest that began just beyond the beachhead. He did not step out onto the dock. This is the Isle of the Dead whispered Seven, gripping the dock post with white knuckles. The ferryman burst into laughter, a short, shocking sound that echoed across the shore like an axe blow. <laughs> there is no Isle of the Dead. The geography of this place is more complicated than you can possibly imagine. 
Why do you think these docks are needed in a ferry, then? I am no mere psychopomp. I am the lake pilot. I know all the waterways, all the isles. There are as many as there are whales in the sea and more whales and sharks and tortoises together. Perhaps whales and sharks and tortoises together with anemones. I know them all. I know the navigable paths. I know where to take each wretched soul that comes to my dock. You wanted to go after her. This is where she came. This is where I brought her and she paid as dearly as you. Never think she did not. She wanted to come to this shore alone of all the others. This is where I take the stars. It is the Isle of Lost Light, and I would not take you beyond it. You are not qualified, and neither are they. Out of the garden. Dinarzade folded her hands in her lap. On every finger was a ring of gold and tiger's eye, so that her hands seemed to look back at her, baleful and fiery and sad. The braziers flickered and warmed her shoulders, and though veils the color of a peacock's head, through veils the color of a peacock's head, she watched the banquet, which seemed to whirl around her like di dishes around a mute centerpiece, or dancers beneath a tall, elaborate lamp that has no choice but to shine. The ivory circlet cut into her skin, and in the morning her forehead would be red and chafed. The man beside her had a thick mustache, had brought her as the sixteenth had brought her as the sixteenth in his parade of gifts, a tiny bird of paradise carved from a single huge pearl, with a tail of trailing sapphires and topaz. Its eyes were dead and shimmering, and when you pulled the tail, some mechanism deep in the bird's throat chimed like a clock. She thought it was meant to be more like a crowing or singing, but to her it sound, no, sounded nothing more than a clock marking the time. She pulled its tail, it chimed. She delicately placed her napkin over it so that she would not have to look it in the eye. She was thinking about the girl in the garden. It was the pirate ship that she remembered when she thought of the girl's stories, the pirate ship and the sad, broken pappas. She thought she understood that, how to give up and give in to the inevitable. She knew what inevitability felt like, how it tasted. It felt like the mustached man's hand on her knee. It tasted like his kisses. She wished that she could cut her hair like a cigarette so that they would stop stringing it with jewels and brushing it straight. She wished that she could cloister herself away from inevitable kisses. She wished that she were an orphan with endless tales to tell and no one to love her enough to bring her birds of pearl. But she was not her brother. She could not bring herself to sit at that girl's feet and listen to her openly. She could not bear the possibility, possibility that the girl was not a bird of pearl that she could not simply pull her tail and hear the chime she longed for. But she did long for it. And where is the Sultan tonight, your brother? Said her suitor amiably, his voice like thick liquor flowing over her and into her skin, whether she willed it or no. He is hunting in the country, my lord, she said, not lifting her eyes under the deep blue veil. After all, when he is not so little a Sultan anymore, he will not have time for such noble pursuits. He took our father's ebony bow and went to shoot a lion in my lord's honor as a wedding present. She wondered at how easy the lie was. Is this how you tell a tale? She thought. You open your mouth and chime. Let whatever seems lovely pour out and hope it sounds more like singing than the tolling of a clock. She warmed to her story and lifted her eyes demurely. My brother is most impressed with my lord. He prefers you infinitely to the younger man who brought all those ghastly roosters. He is most interested in the, in the mechanism of your birds, which he feels is superior to the golden clockwork of that other man. Oh, I would be happy to show him how it is done. I am sure he will be most grateful, my lord. How generous of you to marry his sister and show him such wonders. He will surely re reward my lord beyond measure. My brother is a prodigy in the ways of diplomacy. He spends his nights in contemplation of the movements of nations and governors, and in the perfect halls of his mind, he moves them as deftly and surely as chatrange pieces. He thinks so often and with such intensity that I have with my own eyes seen steam pour from his head as from a kettle. He will be a great sultan when he is grown, and he will always remember the delightful singing of my lord's birds. Your voice is sweeter than the singing of all the birds at once. But not, I think, sweeter than those of all your wives chiming together. But there she had gone too far, 
and a shadow passed over the oiled and perfumed features of her bridegroom. She coughed and summoned up a maidenly brush, lowering her eyes to her plate again. The gold was streaked with goose fat and she had no appetite. Somewhere, far off on its own long table, was the spotted carcass of the giraffe neck, which was so rich and marrow sweet she could not stomach it. A few sapphires peeked out from her napkin. She pulled the strands and shuddered at the sound. When the night was over and her neck ached from keeping her head bowed, she went to the tower room and folded her cloak in half, then in quarters. It was red, dyed over and over until it was so dark that to call it red beside other reds was to call the sun bright beside a lamp. It was lined with deer skin from some country so far off that the deer was shaggy and thick pelted. Its lower hem was trimmed with black wolf tails. It was the simplest, least ornate cloak she owned. She pushed it slowly into her brother's pack, and with it, the little pearl bird. I don't know where it came from, the boy said. I certainly didn't bring it. They told me not to. The girl ran her fingers over the fabric soft as ink. The wolf tails flopped over her small hands, and deer fur ruffled back from the hood. It's all right if you did. But I didn't. I brought the quail eggs and the cinnamon candies. They were... Having goose tonight, it didn't feel right about that. The girl considered it for a while and decided that if he could not work out the clickings and whirrings of his sister's mind, it was far beyond her to do so. She unfurled the coat and the boy helped her heft the thick, heavy thing over her thin shoulders. The prickle of the deer fur on her skin was strange and thrilling, something akin to the slick tang of cinnamon in her mouth. She smiled a little, a little and her teeth were cold in the air. As she arranged the folds around her by the side of her lake, which was strewn with leaves and duck feathers, the little bird fell out into her hands. She looked at the boy curiously, but he shook his head. She pulled the string of sapphires and topaz, and the pearl bird opened its intricate mouth, letting loose a loud, clear chime, like the tiniest church bell in the world. And the girl laughed. And we will pick up there next week with... Uh, the Isle of Lost Light. Does anyone have any questions? We're moving right along. We're covering about 20 pages a week, or 20 pages of reading, uh, so 40 pages a week. Uh, so we're, we're coming up pretty close on the end of uh, this book. I think we have about 74 five pages left uh, in this book, a little bit less. Um, so yeah, we're, we're zooming right through. Um, I love, I mean, I, it's funny because I'm writing right now something that deals with the land of the dead and the underworlds. And I, I love my ferrymen and I can't get enough of them. Practically every culture has some kind of uh, uh, water hazard <laughs> between the land of the living and the land of the dead. A psychopomp, if you don't know the meaning of that word, is literally someone who, who does that, who ferries the living and the dead um, uh, back and forth. And um, I, it's, it's just one of my very favorite things. Uh, is there a legendary creature I haven't written about yet and want to? Um, you know, probably. Uh, there's definitely ones I want to do more. I'd like to do something bigger with a unicorn. Uh, I definitely uh, am, would like to do uh, something more with a dragon, although there is a dragon in this book, and it is uh, one of my favorite, um, if not my favorite, bits of, uh, of the Orphan's Tales. Um, but, I, but both the unicorn and the dragon in the Orphan's Tales are, are little itty-bitty stories and certainly would like to do more, just because they're so overdone. Um, so I'd like to see what I could do with them. I did write... Um, a, a fairly epic poem about a dragon that you can find on Tor.com. It's called What the Dragon Said. Um, and uh, from the reception, I think it's probably one of the better poems that I've written. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm sure that there is. I'm sure that there is. I'm sure there's a million uh, little beasties everywhere. Um, if you crack open any bestiary, there's, there's practically infinite variations uh, on, on any given thing. I have this notion of writing a story about the cinnamon bird, but there's really not a lot of mythology about the cinnamon bird other than that, like, all their nests are cinnamon. So I'm kind of trying to, but I like that phrase so much. I want to do something with it. But I'm not sure, um, you know, there's, there's infinite beasts in the world, uh, both fictional and uh, actual. 
so I'll ensure that I will God catch them all is that the, the legit when it comes to fiction um, maybe maybe not uh, God it's so hot in here <laughs> I think it's actually 79 degrees uh, downstairs in the house uh, and I'm wearing a long heavy shirt yeah I am um, I'm not sure hmm, what do I remember about bits and pieces of this week obviously we're, we're sort of connecting up our dots a little bit uh, but there's definitely a lot of um, uh, the architecture of Florence in this um, I remember getting a bit obsessed with that so uh, the, the sort of stories of the domes that went up is, is connected to that, that particular time in my obsessive life I do have air conditioning but it's extremely loud so I don't have it on um, for the reading and, uh, you know, to save energy, I tend to only have it on in a room that I'm actually in. So, uh, it's very hot down here as I've been upstairs, uh, working. So I have a book due very soon. Uh, so I'm, I'm working like a mad lady. Um, no, I'm not switching to summer attire because when this is all over, you will be able to watch it straight through and it will be as though it all happened on one night because I'm wearing the same outfit every time and I've done my hair the same way and I've done my makeup and I've got the glasses on and everything. So you'll be able, it will, there will be an illusion uh, as though it all happened, you know, several nights running and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to give up that illusion for personal comfort. Uh, the show must go on, uh, even though I'm sweating like a bastard. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'll do my outro stuff. If you have more questions, you can just pop them right up. Uh, as always, uh, this is not an audiobook. It is a play, a uh, one-woman performance. Um, ah, see, I did it different. Uh, you can get music based on these books at sjtucker.com. You can find copies of them at your local independent bookseller's web portal. Uh, mine is printbookstore.com. You can find me on Twitter at Kat Valenti. Uh, you can find me on Cameo at Catherine Valenti if you like. Uh, and you can find me on Patreon at Kat Valenti as well and subscribe there. There's a lot of con content on my Patreon, um, so I highly recommend subscribing. Um, you can catch up in the archive on YouTube at Kat Valenti Live. These do tend to go up within a day or so of, uh, of me having recorded them here. And you can catch them on my Instagram profile as well. Um, and if you like, you can drop a little something in the tip jar, uh, my Instagram profile, my YouTube profile, or my website, which is katherineandvalenti.com. Uh, these are free readings, but if you can contribute anything, uh, COVID has, has wrecked hell on the lives of freelancers, and it would be deeply, deeply appreciated. And I will thank you by name on the next stream if you uh, contribute anything. Every penny really means a lot to this household. So thank you for considering it. Um, do I have any more ideas for Quidnunx titles, or is that secret? So the main character of, of this novel is Osmo Unknown, and I feel like mm, putting that name in the title might work somehow, but I'm not really sure how. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm basically not thinking about it. I'm gonna send it to my editor and be like, obviously this title is not gonna fly. So what do you think? Because uh, I'm very bad at titles if it, if it isn't instantly obvious, um, and I am not above asking my editor for <laughs> title help. So uh, we'll see uh, how she feels about it. Um, so yeah, it'll be something. I'm not sure. I'll let you know as soon as I do. That's why I keep calling it middle grade fantasy because like somewhere in writing this book, it became clear to me that I was not actually going to call it the Quidnunks, uh, because that is a word no one knows or can pronounce. And I learned my lesson with Palimpsest. Um, so it'll be something, but I don't really know. Uh, we'll see. Um, thank you all so much for coming by tonight and uh, listening and sharing this moment with me. It really keeps me going. I hope it helps you keep going. Uh, it's almost like going out somewhere and listening to someone do something uh, and being served at table. Um, so uh, you and me together, guys, we'll, we'll make it through this one way or another. Uh, and I uh, love you all. I'll see you on Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Same fairy tale time, same fairy tale channel.